Uh, howdy, everyone. Uh, quick trigger warning. This has to do with a lot of nasty white supremacist, racist, neo-Nazi types. Uh, I, I recognize that it can be triggering, so please take all the time you need. Um, and yeah, my name is Sebastian Pereca. I am studying history in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'm going to be talking about my project today, Vanguard of Reconquista. Um, huge thank you to Professor Alexis Perry, who advised my project and helped me in insane ways. So huge thank you. Um, so first, I really need to address the current Russian invasion of Ukraine. I would be remiss if I didn't. Um, so Russia has used the denazification of Ukraine uh, to justify its unprovoked invasion. And not only are these claims um, really insincere and inaccurate, uh, they're also incredibly hypocritical given uh, Russia's alleged war crimes against Ukrainian civilians, as well as the blatant neo-imperialism of the entire invasion. Um, that being said, uh, we can't really ignore the fact that there is a sizable extreme right movement in Ukraine. Um, and in a, in a uh, conflict as complex as this, uh, both of these things can be simultaneously true. And we need to reject and speak out against not only Russia and its and its violent invasion, but also the extreme right in Ukraine. Um, moving on to my main argument. Um, so I essentially argue that the Ukrainian extreme right movement has been instrumental in creating a, in the meta-political meta creation of a transnational interconnected extreme right culture. Um, I do this through looking at mainly far-right paramilitarism, uh, street activism, and cultural phenomena, such as clothing brands, music, et cetera. And, and metapolitics in this case is essentially more or less um, the creation of culture and cultural po projects as a means to deepen ideologies and worldviews as, to, as opposed to more overtly political strategies. Um, so for methods, I relied mainly on anonymously monitoring um, publicly available social media um, and online posts by various groups and networks uh, using sites like Telegram, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, as well as uh, blogs and websites for certain groups and networks. Um, I also used investigative journalism and um, secondary scholarly articles to inform my research. Um, so before I fully get into my main argument, uh, some context is needed to understand the far right in Ukraine. So all starts in 2014, big year for Ukraine. Um, so first you had the Euromaidan uprisings, um, which started in late 2013, uh, when tens and thousands of Ukrainians rose up to fight against and overthrow the political or the Russian backed uh, government of Viktor Yanukovych. Um, the far right constituted a really, really small numeric uh, minority, but because uh, the far right is the far right, they were very well versed in violence and were very prominent in some of the most vicious street fighting of, and riots of the uprising. Uh, so after Euromaidan, Russia retaliated by invading Crimea and backing uh, violent separatists in the Donbas region in southeastern Ukraine. Um, these Russian-backed se separatists kicked off a civil war in the region um, and in an attempt to create several Russian-aligned republics. Um, and just having gone through a change of government, Ukraine was not prepared to fight a civil war. Um, and they need to ride the wave of this patriotism to essentially rely on battalions of volunteers, uh, some of which had very far-right uh, political orientations. Uh, so all of this culminated in the far-right movement gaining significant cultural capital and being tolerated not as a hateful extremist group, but rather as patriots and defenders of Ukraine, an image which they still continue to exploit. Um, so this influence by the uh, Ukrainian extreme right and cultural capital was gained not only in Ukraine, but also in the extreme right worldwide. Um, to demonstrate this, I want to go over one of many case studies uh, involving an American neo-Nazi group called the Rise Above Movement, or RAM. Uh, it was founded in 2017 in Southern California by a guy named Robert Rundo, who gathered um, white supremacists from across the region and began holding meetups and, and MMA, or mixed martial arts, training camps for them. 
They would apply these fighting techniques to various uh, far-right rallies where they would unfortunately beat the tar out of leftist political opponents and counter-protesters. Uh, they would then post all this on social media in stylized edits. Uh, the group was short-lived. A lot of its members were arrested and faced hefty prison sentences. Um, but since then, um, Rob Rundo, who is now a fugitive somewhere in Eastern Europe, uh, largely morphed the group into a fascist lifestyle brand, complete with a clothing line, podcasts, unique organizing styles, and even now a small documentary film crew. Um, so Rundo and his brand have become a major cultural aspect of the American white supremacist movement. Um, and this was largely done with the influence of Ukraine, both directly and indirectly. Uh, so let's get into how now. Um, so Rundo and other RAM members traveled a lot to Ukraine um, when they existed and met and networked with groups like the Azov movement. Um, Rundo also specifically cited a Russian-turned Ukrainian far-right clothing brand um, and MMA promoter Denis Kasputin and his band, or, or, or his brand White Rex as an inspiration for the Fight Club style and his de decision to launch it as a, a lifestyle brand type thing. Um, Ram in many ways mimicked a very specific uh, street activist style um, from various groups, specifically in Ukraine, uh, where members are fit, uh, trained in trained in fighting, and equipped well and equipped with well made, uh, and in their opinion, stylish uh, far right merchandise with coded symbols, coded in the sense that the average eye wouldn't be able to tell that they're far right, um, and and you can see kind of by these pictures that they're they're adapting um, kind of urban street art styles, right? Uh, the the picture furthest from me, that's a group in Colorado uh, putting up graffiti dedicated to Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, and on and the more colorful one is a group in Ukraine putting up Ukrainian nationalist graffiti. Um, this also sees itself play out in organizing as well, uh, where um, so Rob Rundo and Dennis Nikitin had actually a short-lived podcast together uh, called Active Club, where the pair where the pair shared advice on how to organize small localized white supremacist groups, uh, using through Kasputin a lot of organizing tactics from the extreme right in Ukraine and Russia. Um, so using these tactics directly, as well as posts made by Rundo on social media on the subject, um, American white supremacists took this brand, um, Rundo's you know, whole lifestyle brand thing, and began formulating actual active clubs, small localized white supremacist groups across the United States. Um, so you can see now through this, the Ukrainian extreme right is actively influencing organizing styles in America. And this is not just in America. This is across the globe. Rundo and his brand have tens of thousands of followers um, across various social media channels. Um, and yeah, so to conclude and wrap up, um, while it's been very much changed by the war, the Ukrainian extreme right movement has had a lasting impact on extreme right culture and has shaped how aspects of the transnational far right organize, present themselves visually, and create culture. Um, these are some things I wish I had time for in my research um, or want to explore further, uh, data-driven analysis, ethnographies, as well as, you know, act I have a little bit of knowledge in Russian, but not much. Um, and, and language er, and um, research in the main language. So thank you so all so much for attending today. It means so much to me. Thank you to, to everyone who helped in this. And please feel free to email me any questions and I'll be taking questions now as well. I'll, I'll go back to pictures to give you something to chew on. <laughs> Fantastic work. I'll start with a question yeah. um, while others think. So in 451, we've worried about you. I <laughs> yes. thought about you so much after the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you reflect on what it was like to sit in these chat rooms and listen and I don't what that participation, the kind of research method, and then was what you were hearing changed in March? 
Yes, yeah, so in all the social media monitoring, I was very passive. I was not necessarily engaging with any of these people. I was just looking at what they posted. Um, so that was a huge point of safety for myself. Um, they, yeah. Um, but it was very bizarre um, to see the invasion unfold and how they talked about it. Um, everyone is trying to claim that X, that Russia or Ukraine is either run by Jewish people or some other anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant conspiracy theory. Um, and there's a whole lot of like very weird like racial science debates going on. And it, it's very weird. Um, and yeah, they, it's just like tons and tons of arguing about like conspiracy theories and minutia, which is interesting to watch play out. But um, it was definitely surprising to see. One last question. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thank um, you. In terms of sort of uh, international linkages between the far right, you looked at the US and Ukraine. Did you also see patterns between um, Poland and Hungary, which have a pretty institutionalized far right in Ukraine, or were those less visible? Um, Poland, certainly much more so than Hungary. Poland is a little weird um, because for whatever reason, there are still a lot of far-right activists who gravitate a lot towards Russia. So um, you have a lot of um, Russian far-right folks um, being connected to Poland. Um, but actually, when the, when the war started, um, I remember seeing a video of a member of a Polish neo-fascist group um, was actually one of the first people to go and volunteer with um, one of the one of the main Ukrainian far right groups and fight in the war. So there's definitely connections there. I would say specifically with Poland, there is much more of a focus on Russia, though.